My name is Lars Kohlind. Uh, I'm in South Africa for the Scouts, working with the Scouts, but I've also taken time to visit the University of Stellenbosch Business School to lecture about unboss. And unboss is the opposite of the boss, the leader of the future. And this person is the leader of the unlimited organization. And it's absolutely weird. It's like nothing you've ever heard before. So I invite you to listen to and to watch the 15 minutes summary that will follow. Good luck. I think I would take uh, my previous company, which was uh, Oticon, O-T-I-C-O-N, and uh, today the leading, in every respect, leading hearing aid company of the world. It recreated itself as a movement for quality of life for the heart of hearing. And we asked them, what can we do for you so that your patients, they call them patients, so your patients can be more happy? And they, they, they thought we were selling hearing aids, but, but they realized we were genuinely interested in making people more happy. The company of the future is a movement. It is a social network of people that are united for a common cause. They share a common passion. This is the mindset that you need to acquire. First, you have to unlearn a, an antiquated, irrelevant mindset of business that you, you're taught at this business school, I suppose. <laughs> and uh, the first step in change is to realize that you have an opportunity to do better. So my point, <coughs> and this is the theme of the speech, is actually to change the mindset of management. So let us look at the conventional mindset for management. This is a limited company. And um, it starts with people putting money into it. General Assembly, establishment of a functional hierarchy with management levels, with titles, with job descriptions, ISO 9000, what have you, certification, all of that stuff, accounting, you have it. It also, it starts with, you know, why do people invest money in companies? It's actually to get a return. That's what we do. That's the mindset of conventional management. Return. Another part of that mindset is, as I said, the functional hierarchy. Functions are necessary in the company, and there are people who do, who do it, and then there are people above these people who control it, and who plan, and who think, and who uh, correct and command and whatever they do. Dividing work into small pieces and then having other people plan and control and command, what have you, is actually a very old idea. It's more than a, a hundred years old. And it was perfected by two people, Max Weber and Frederick Taylor. Taylor, as you know, published his groundbreak groundbreaking book on the principles of scientific management exactly 100 years ago, 1911. What he said is that if you are to run large-scale manufacturing, you can't just have a small workshop with 20 people and another one over there with 20 people. You have to have a big factory. And a big factory can only work if you divide the work into small pieces. The interesting point is that that model, which was originally designed for a factory and for a, an office that did transaction work, which was sort of a, an office factory, spread to everywhere. For instance, if you take uh, the HR function, is about uh, getting people, uh, the best people coming, uh, getting to work, paying them as little as possible, because you've got to be efficient and make money. <coughs> so you pay them as little as possible, you take them in, and you need to maybe give them so, some education, but not too much. And for each of those aspects of our mindset for management, there is a production date, the day when this idea was created. Now, ever since 1911, we'd worked on improving it. And we're still working on improving it. My point is that we are improving or perfecting the irrelevant. You know, I'm, I'm not a theory guy, I'm a doer. 
I'll explain to you what I did at this hearing aid company, which was the first time I realized that there's something out there. First thing I did was to take away every single department. Just finish, terminate, over. If you have no departments, you need no leaders or leaders, worker, bosses. So now you have a bunch of people, today we'd call that a social network, but a bunch of people, 145, no departments, no titles, with just one team. At the same time, why not take away the job descriptions? Just quit it. So this is what's called liberation. Now you're free to do exactly what you think will make the greatest contribution to the purpose or the cause. So imagine that now you move from this wonderful office building and actually uh, produced a bit of cash selling it and just move into a very raw factory. So when you've taken all of this away, why not take away the paper as well? And, you know, paper, the only reason why you have paper is that you don't have computers. And since we had computers, we could do without paper. That is the company of the future. And this was done, which was probably to your great surprise, in 1991. And even today, 20 years after, you haven't done it yet. The guy who manages this type of organization is not a boss. What would this person look like? It would be a person that would not command anybody, because nobody would listen to him. Bad luck. But it would be a person that would, first of all, keep the common course and the vision for where we were going and what we wanted to do collectively, keep that alive. And it would be a person that would create mechanisms for this chaotic organization to actually be well coordinated and focused on the course and efficient. The unboss would have to create three mechanisms. One is a project-based mechanism and every person would select which projects that he or she would love to work on. The rule would be that you'd probably work on something that you were qualified to do. Most people want to do that. In addition to that, you should work on at least two tasks that you would not be qualified to do, which forces everybody to broaden their mindset. Second mechanism is a mechanism of profession, which implies that the company would map what sort of professions are, uh, do we need, and we had about 20-some professions, We'd find the best qualified person, call him a guru for each profession, and we'd invite every single person to attach or link him or herself to whatever gurus they thought was relevant for them. The third one, the people mechanism, it would also be their choice who they would like to have as their mentor. So here are three actually self-regulating mechanisms. A people mechanism, a project mechanism, and a profession mechanism. And if you combine those three with a common goal and a consensus in, in, in going towards that common goal, and a number of traffic rules to make sure that we were not all stepping on each other's toes, then you have an organization that is uniquely efficient, that creates such a quality of life for whoever is in it, and which can take any competitor out of any market in any industry. You see what leadership is about. It's about something very different from drawing up budgets and controlling and having reports and all of that stuff. It's about shaping the future and driving the company forward. You can let that go as well, because it's impossible to manage an organization like that through a budget. So why waste time on doing it? I have a much easier solution. <laughs> what you do, and I'm a mathematician, so I can calculate. In our economy, and it's the, this figure is different in South Africa, but I'm just using the Danish company, the Danish figures. In a head office like this, the cost of one full-time employee is a million rand, roughly. That's what it costs, including everything. So why not just make a budget by multiplying the number of people with a million rand? That's your budget. And then you divide that number by 12, 
And every month, you take a look at the accounts and say, have we spent more than one twelfth of that combined amount? And if we have spent more, we'd have a town hall meeting, and I'd say, hey, you guys, we're moving a little bit too fast. We're burning a little bit too much. Let us just lower our burn rate a little bit. Imagine what you save. Within 24 months after this change, turnover doubled, and the number of people necessary to perform all these functions that we were doing before dropped into half. So that's a 400% efficiency gain. The key task in the limited conventional companies that you're in, you believe perhaps is keep everything well organized. The key task of the unlimited, unbossed company is to keep things disorganized. And that's much more difficult. But a very difficult point is how do you work without a budget? And it's actually easy, and I, I told you how to adjust it. But there's one interesting advantage of not having a budget. Here, we made a budget, we've applied, we have adopted it in December, and in May, we get a brilliant idea. This is really something that would change everything. But we, it's not in the budget. Too bad. And then comes a long and difficult negotiation process. Where we'll try to find the money the best we can. Not at Oticon. Because if somebody has a brilliant idea and we think this is really something we want to do, we'll just do it. And it'll cost whatever it costs. And if we're now spending too much, we'll just lower the burn rate a little bit. That's it. So imagine the dynamics of a company that has resources to do everything it really, really wants to do. Fantastic. You wouldn't like to compete against people like that. Lean can help get your processes right. So it's actually not so stupid. But if you get your processes right, it's fine. The point is that you can really harvest the benefits of doing what you're doing if you realize that the better the discipline and the, the design of your processes are, the more disciplined you are, the better processes you have, the more freedom you can have at the human level, the social level, the organizational level. But most companies actually take lean as a means to, to control and to, to make people's work less in, uh, interesting. But you can actually use that, uh, way of, uh, that uh, concept as a platform for liberating people in thinking and working, doing different things, etc. I left Oticon, at, uh, in, we took it, we built it up, made it the world leader, took it public, uh, and showed that we could do it. I left in 98, after 10 years. And then, what did I do? I started companies. And ever since, I've started 25 new businesses. So I know what, what uh, this is. And this is even easier if you start a new business. Because then you can set the rules, and you can attract the people, and you can design everything from the beginning this way. And it is striking. Some of my businesses have failed, and I've learned from that. But my, there's no question that our hit record, our track record in starting new businesses and growing them, making them successful, big impact, is much better than the average. So my point is that this actually applies to uh, new businesses as well. And there's one aspect that I didn't mention, but I take that. In every single, almost, new business I've started, these businesses are co-owned between uh, me, typically the, the main shareholder, and everybody working there. My experience is that it is easier to get, um, to be forgiven, uh, you know, I speak in a foreign language, it's easier to get, to get to be forgiven than to get permission. Uh, that's a better way of saying that. So my, my answer is actually just uh, like Nike, just do it. <laughs> just do it. And before we finish, I just want to say it's great to have you here. And I think we've had a wonderful time. But frankly speaking, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. So go for it. <laughs>